Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm the introducer of today's speaker. Uh, first, thank you for coming. Uh, the first speaker today is Lisa Devedder. She is assistant professor of horticulture, WSU Northwest Washington Research and Extension Center. So her uh, title is evaluating the impacts of border vegetation patterns on multifunctional biodiversity and the crop production in Washington blueberry. Great. All right, well, thank you, Washeen. And I'm actually going to be sharing, sharing the stage with several other individuals that are listed here on this slide. But really what the purpose of what we're looking at here is not just pollination, how different types of border habitats influence pollination, but we're also looking at how border habitats influence population of beneficial and pest insects, as well as birds. And so we got funding to do this project through BioAg, which is an internal grant pr program at Washington State University that seeks to look at uh, what are some biologically based ways to ma manage and mitigate certain issues that we face in agriculture, and we can benefit certain services in our agricultural systems. So you're going to be hearing from Mr. Matt Arrington, or I should say Dr. Arrington. Um, he's a PhD student in my program, and he just finished his thesis work this semester. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Hollis Spittler um, and Dr. Bev Gerdeman's program. They're going to be talking about the entomological component of this research. I also acknowledge Dr. Bill Snyder and Olivia Smith. They represent the ornithological or bird component of this study, and then myself. So to set the stage, as many of you are aware of, is that pollination in blueberry is constrained, and that can limit fruit set, berry size, and overall productivity here in Western Washington. And this constraint is primarily due to low pollinator activity during our bloom time. And our primary pollinator is honeybee, and the conditions during bloom are often cold and wet, which really limits honeybee foraging. And we see that in fruit set yields and other important components of production. So in our program, we've been really interested at finding ways to improve pollination and fruit set here in Western Washington blueberry. And this project represents one way that we're trying to look at ways we can improve pollination and fruit set through modification of different border habitats. I really should say modification really we're looking at what existing borders that are currently found in blueberry systems and what types of impacts they have on various aspects of our systems. And there's reasons why we wanted to look at this, and it is because of some pretty compelling research that came out of Michigan State University in Dr. Rufus Isaac's program, where they were looking at uh, wildflower plantings planted adjacent to commercial blueberry and compared that to their control, which is just mode vegetation. And what they found in the course of their four-year research was that there was an overall increase in the diversity and abundance of pollinator species and this led to a significant increase in fruit set, berry size, seed number, and yields. And in some follow-up papers, they demonstrated that for the farms that they were working on for that project, that revenue increased as well through these modified habitats. So pretty interesting work that came out of their program. They also looked at other types of insects in their studies, and what they found that with that type of planting that they had next to the blueberry fields, that there was an increased abundance of predaceous arthropods that could serve some form of biological control. In addition, there's an impact that border vegetation might have on predatory birds, so birds that are either insectivorous that could feed on pest insects in a blueberry system, or raptors that could feed on birds that predate on blueberry fruit, like starlings and cedar waxwings. And then increasingly, we're hearing more and more interest from some producers for bee-friendly certifications and labels with uh, you know, the increased interest in pollinator conservation. So depending on your buyer, having some type of border that increases pollinator might be of interest on these farms. So just kind of to highlight some of the really interesting work that came out of Dr. Isaac's program, um, I wanted to show this slide here. So what you're looking at are three figures. The first one is um, honeybee visitation on the blueberry crop. And there was no difference in honeybee visitation in the blueberry across the two different treatments. But when we look at native bees and hoverflies, which also pollinate blueberry flowers, by year three and four, there was a significant increase in their visitation um, in, the, in the fields that were adjacent to these wildflower plantings. But then there's also some drawbacks that we can see with this different types of border vegetation. For one is that border vegetation might actually draw pollinators away from the field. So we see this and I hear this from other types of producers that are concerned that say maybe dandelions or other types of flowering plants on the perimeter they're planting might deter honeybees from entering into their blueberry field because the blueberry flower is 
less appealing to a honeybee and a lot of other pollinators than other things that might be adjacent to that landscape. In addition, spotted wing drosophila has been found to overwinter in evergreen uh, vegetation and flowering plants adjacent to vegetation might supplement spotted wing drosophila nutrition. So this can potentially increase the survivorship of spotted wing drosophila and increase subsequent pest populations later on in the production season. In addition, there's some concern that border vegetation may in fact actually provide a habitat for different types of insects, uh, for birds. Birds that either predate on the blueberry fruit themselves or also have the potential to transport foodborne illness. So there's several different conflicting messages that border vegetation might have. And we were curious to look at that here in Western Washington blueberry fields. So the objectives of this project, which is just a one year study to do gather some preliminary information to see if there's anything worthwhile to follow up on, was to look at the impacts of border vegetation and on their multifunctional biodiversity with an emphasis on how are they impacting pollination services, how are they impacting populations of beneficial and pest insects, how are they impacting bird species, and then of course elements of crop production. So we don't have wildflower plantings and we're not prepared to plant wildflower plantings or ask producers as part of on-farm cooperative trials to plant wildflower plantings, but we do have different types of habitats that we have here in Western Washington that we utilize as treatments for the study. So our first was our control habitat, where it was just mowed vegetation and perhaps in some situations it was adjacent to another field of say a blueberry crop or a potato crop. So pretty, not, pretty, um, not very diverse in terms of uh, pollinator or uh, plant diversity. The other type of habitat that we looked at was perennial vegetation, particularly woody perennial plants like this arborvitae that you see here that was one of our treatments. And then our third and final treatment was herbaceous vegetation. So a mixture of monocots and broadleaf plants that was mostly kept unmowed. And what you see here too on this image is a sticky card that Matt placed out in the fields to look at how different types of insect species were moving into the blueberry field and exiting the blueberry field. So we had these three treatments and we had uh, three fields per treatment and we looked at this in the cultivars Duke, Draper, and Liberty. So I'm going to talk about the bird component of the study. So we had Dr. Snyder and Olivia to help us out with the ornological component, um, but I was the one that performed these measurements, and we did bird point counts twice per farm from the 24th of July to the 27th of August. The reason that it stretched out over that time frame is because of the different fruiting times of the cultivars that we included in the study, and we wanted to ensure that when we were out collecting bird count data that there was blue fruit present to kind of attract birds into that landscape, and we can get a measurement of how um, those populations exist in those farms. So the counts occurred from sunrise to 10 a.m. and each point encompassed 50 meters, which is about 164 feet. And 50 meters was um, our radius. And so within that 50 meter, that was considered in plot and each plot was separated by 100 meters. And how we collected these data was recording the number of individual bird species that we either observed or heard uh, within a 10 minute period and we followed the Farnsworth removal method and that's a standard method of looking at different bird species and various types of habitats and it's used in ornithological research. And so we see here on this figure is um, one of the farms that we surveyed in this trial and the different points um, that we use for these bird point counts. So we just focused on a few species of birds that we thought had the potential to predate on blueberry fruit or could potentially serve some type of biological control in these fields. And so what you'll see here are the abbreviations. Those are standard ornithological abbreviations that are used for surveying different types of bird populations. And you'll see them on the subsequent slides when I go through some of the data. Those species include the American crow, the American robin, cedar waxwings, house finch, uh, white crowned sparrows, uh, barn swallows, which are not ones that predate on blueberry fruit, but are ones that can feed on some of the insects present in a planting. And then others, um, the others include species that we didn't see in high abundance, but I wanted to include them nevertheless. And those include um, bald eagles. We also saw red-tailed hawk, um, uh, violet greens, song sparrows and hummingbirds. And you'll notice that starlings are not present in this list. I thought we would be observing a lot of starlings because I've seen them feeding on blueberries, but in this study, we observe very few starlings in the, through the course of the studies and the bird point counts. So here's the data. Um, this is the number of observations, again, through visual observations or hearing within our plot, so within that 50 meter radius. And so for the American crow, we saw a greater number of American crows in the herbaceous habitat relative to the other treatments. Um, for the American robin, we saw very few American robins in the perennial and her, um, perennial habitat for both American robin and cedar waxwing, whereas both of those species are relatively equally distributed in the herbaceous and control 
Um, house bench we observed in the greatest number and they were relatively equally distributed across the different uh, treatments or habitat situations that we looked at. The white crowned sparrows we observed very few in the control habitat, um, but relatively equal populations or equal numbers within um, the perennial and herbaceous habitat. For barn swallow, we observed them in greatest numbers within the control habitat and very few in our other two treatments. And then for our others, which is just a mixture of different species, um, we observe very few in our control habitat and more in the perennial and herbaceous. And I want to show you the data for out of plot. So beyond that 50 meter radius, you'll see that um, there's a greater number of American crows and American robins that we observed, and they are relatively equally distributed among our different types of habitat treatments, with the exception of American robin. We still saw very few American robins and cedar waxwings with the perennial habitat. House finch, still fairly high numbers. Um, more of them were present in our perennial habitat. White crowned sparrow, um, again, relatively equally distributed among the different habitats. Our barn swallow, we saw very few in the herbaceous habitat situation, and again, relatively equal distributions um, within the control and the perennial. And then for our other, we saw less in the control. And so, like, really, the take home message from this uh, first year study is that species and their populations do vary by habitat. Um, any types of actions to be taken in terms of trying to encourage predaceous birds that could deter, you know, birds that you don't necessarily want in your field situation. We really don't have any recommendations or anything at this time. Okay, so with that, I'm going to let Nat Arrington come up and talk about what he did with the pollination component of the study. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of change gears here, talk a little bit about pollinators and what we saw in regard to, to native and honeybee uh, pollinators, and then also talk a little bit about uh, some of the production attributes that, that we looked at. So to start out with, um, in, in evaluating the honeybee visitation, uh, as well as bumblebees and other native pollinators, uh, what we did was we divided our our field sites into three rows. Um, each of those rows, we had 10 plants per row that were approximately 10 meters apart. And then those uh, 30 plants per site served as observational plants. Uh, and that's where we, where we observed visitation of pollinators. And so for each plant in each site, we were um, looking at uh, three one minute intervals per plant where we're just watching for for pollinators that are pollinating flowers. So we're excluding uh, nectar robbing where, where bees may be entering from the base of the flower. We're excluding kind of clumsy pollination where they may be fumbling around but not actually pollinating. Um, and uh, those, those visitations were repeated on three separate days. Uh, so that, that kind of made up that first component. And then another important thing to mention, like Lisa mentioned um, with cold weather uh, precipitation, these things reducing pollinator activity. We were only looking, evaluating visitation rates during kind of these optimal pollination conditions. So uh, when it wasn't raining, when wind speeds were relatively low, uh, between 10 a.m. And, and 3 or 4 p.m., and then uh, when temperatures were above 55 degrees, ideally above 65 degrees, but 55 was kind of our cutoff. And so these are the conditions that we were looking at at uh, visitation. In addition to these visitation characteristics, we also looked at uh, kind of crop production attributes. And what I mean by that is we evaluated um, the bloom number across sites as a way of kind of standardizing these sites and making sure that we were dealing with sites that were similar enough uh, to where our statistics would hold up. And then we looked at estimated yield and uh, fruit weight. And what we saw was largely similar to the bird component of the study, that there weren't significant differences between these treatment levels uh, for fruit set, estimated yield, fruit weight. So our production attributes remained the same, regardless of what kind of border material um, we, were, we were dealing with. And I think that something that's important to note, and that kind of comes out in the bird piece, and again in the insect piece after I'm finished, is that uh, the picture seems to be more complicated than this kind of easy breakdown into these three categories. And that's something that, that I'll talk a little bit more about in this next slide. 
Um, this looks at visitation by site. And so you can see across the top there, we have uh, the control perennial and herbaceous um, border materials. And then the green is honeybees and the blue are bumblebees in those same sites. And so you can see that there's not uh, a strong trend um, that, that sticks to these border vegetation, border material categories. Uh, but what we did see was certain sites that had attributes that kind of uh, exceeded our, our, uh, our, our three clean cut categories. And those were sites where we, we consistently had, may have had more bumblebees. Um, or we also can see some differences where stocking densities uh, at certain sites were higher than, than other sites. And that comes through in, in maybe our honeybee counts. Um, so I think though it's important to remember as we look at this kind of data is yes, it's preliminary and it, it's, a, it's a single year, but also I think it paints a picture that this border vegetation is, is a much more complicated uh, topic than just kind of this clean cut uh, categories. Um, in addition to those uh, production attributes and the pollination, we also looked at placing yellow sticky cards uh, out in the field. And so I just want to talk really briefly about how we did that and then kind of what we found. Uh, so as you saw in one of Lisa's pictures, sorry, I think I moved away from the microphone there. What you saw in one of Lisa's pictures was that uh, the sticky cards were clipped with a kind of a, a binder clip to a wood post, and then we placed those in the field. Three of them were placed out in the border vegetation um, with the sticky parts facing away from the field and towards the field. And then three were placed in the rows in the field at 10, 20, and 30 meters. Um, and those sticky cards were placed at the beginning of the season, um, and then we, we switched them out every two weeks. So we collected them, saved them to evaluate later, and then put new sticky cards out. Um, and then this allowed us to kind of evaluate after the fact what the populations looked like at different points in the season, um, what these populations of, of various insects looked like uh, in the field versus out in the border vegetation. And so with that, uh, this is kind of the more interesting piece of what we found. So we didn't see any, again, didn't see any um, response in the sticky cards to border treatment. Um, what we did see was, as expected, that there were higher numbers of, of these. Uh, the, so this, sorry, I should probably say that in this piece, we're only looking at parasitic wasps and, and aphids. Um, and this was just uh, to take a more simple approach to, to what we're seeing out there um, as horticulturists. That was important uh, for our sanity. But uh, as you can see here, um, the early versus the late, we're seeing higher populations of both aphids and parasitic wasps later in the season than early in the season, as well as greater numbers of both the, the, uh, the parasitic wasps and the aphids in the row, uh, or sorry, in the, uh, the border vegetation than we're seeing it in the rows. Um, so again, these are just some of the trends that we saw. I think ultimately the thing that's important to remember is, is what I mentioned before, that it's a complicated issue, and this is just kind of scraping the surface of it. Uh, we're not really seeing a strong correlation between uh, any results and these specific categories, uh, but there definitely is interesting information um, that pertains to specific border conditions. Um, and so with that, I want to turn time over to Hollis to finish this up here. Thanks, Matt. Can everybody hear me okay? Or should this be in a little further like that? Because I'm shorter, right? Is that okay? All right. So our part of the study was to evaluate 
the populations that we found in these three different areas. And we were going to do that. And this is a, a, a through the entomology department, and that's uh, Dr. Ben Gerberman and myself, and then some people that work for us that we made do all the work. Okay, so I'm trying to remember how to do this. Sorry. Next slide is just what? Hit. Huh? That way, Carol? Very good. Okay. So, like any other study that you ever try to set up, sorry about this. The concern in blueberries is the spotted wing Dysophila. So, they apparently read our proposal and left. This shows you a little what happened down in Skagit County. They, uh, the extension people put out 35 traps with attractants and still got extremely low numbers. In the studies that we did in the places, the, the nine different locations that we looked at, guess how many spotted wing Drosophila we found throughout the whole year? Zero, okay? And we looked really hard. This was not only putting vinegar traps in the blue blueberries, but also having vinegar traps in our different locations. We found nothing. So we'll talk a little bit about other things. Locations again, we've seen this. We have the grass areas that we call the controls. We have the heavier grass areas, which we're calling herbaceous. And then we have the tree line stuff. And we placed vinegar cups in all those locations and were able to collect insects without finding any of our friends. This is the machine we used. It's a DVAC. And being old, I use younger people to use the DVAC. I started out with a DVAC back in the 60s, which went on a backpack and had a big hose that came over your head and walked down through cotton, which was over my head. And that was another story. So in this machine, we'll suck everything that's in that area. And our, we usually ran 30 seconds. So in 30 seconds, we had a lot of stuff. We have a preliminary to keep the, the weeds and grass clippings and things like that out. We pull that off and then we take the net inside that has the insects, invert it into a plastic bag, and put it in a cooler. Then it's brought down and placed in a cooler again. We cool this down, then we freeze them, and then we have people look at them in the lab and count the number of insects found in each of these trips. Same with, we took the uh, vinegar, replaced it weekly, and then looked for anything that might be in the vinegar. And what was really interesting this year is we found virtually nothing in the vinegar. So you have non-pests, a lot of these are beneficials. Many of them are, you see from time to time, some of these are very small, most of you wouldn't notice them, but they're out there. The main ones that Matt's already talked about are up here, the predation, oops, apparently I can't do that. The predator moths, so, and in yellow over here, Spiders. The bad guys, the spotted wing Drosophila, we never found. We found aphids and we found thrips. Overall, in all the weeks that we did this, which was 16 weeks at nine locations, this is the, looks at the total combination of what we found over all these areas. So the herbaceous, the taller grasses, had over 40% of the insects that we found. The perennial areas where the trees are, and our brevites are located about 25%, and the controls were at 35%. We break this down into the ones that we really found were interesting, which are parasitic wasps, spiders, aphids, and thrips, you'll notice that the herbaceous tends to have the most in percentage. They also had the most, how shall I say that, the most different types of things, okay? Sometimes you wouldn't find stuff in certain other places at certain times. 
but you found most of the insects that we looked at, which I think were 10 different insects, or I should also say arthropods, which are the eight-legged critters also. But we're not going to get into that. We're just going to talk about the things that mainly we are concerned with in blueberries. Again, the sites. These are the control sites. Short mowed grass most of the time. And if you look at this really carefully, you'll see the insects didn't really start to climb except for the the parasitic wasps did a little jumping right at the end of May as it started to warm up. It's like they're on the hunt, all right? Aphids, notice that the predatory wasps kind of follow the aphids getting bigger and bigger. And then we have these down times, these little bumps down in here. And we can talk about what's going on there maybe a little bit later. Uh, thrips didn't really get going until things start to really warm up towards the end of July. And the spiders were just sort of hanging in there in the controls. When we look at the herbaceous place, the taller grasses, we find this sort of thing going. A lot more of the predator wasps follow, kind of staying right there with the aphids. But look at these dips again, too. It's the same thing with the thrips. Most of this is happening in the warmer time of the summer. Then we look at the perennial sites. Very interesting. The thrips were really heavy there, and then all of a sudden they just drop right out. The aphids kind of build a little bit. Predators kind of keep on going. And towards the end of the year, lots of spiders. But what, what does a tree provide? For a spider, it provides a lot of a good place to live, especially those that are webbing. So, factors. I think there are other factors probably that were doing this. One of the things I wanted to say was the weather factors probably had something to do with it. The number of mows that went on in the controls, things that were going on in the crop, what sort of things were going on in the crop which could infect, in, involve or in, um, affect what we were collecting outside the crop area of course is what do they do as the fruit starts to bl get blue is they start doing sprays so these sprays probably had some influence on what we are finding and that's probably accounting for some of those dips again different types of sprayers it doesn't matter what kind of spraying is going on if there's spraying going on the reason some of these hedgerows and stuff are there are to sort of keep this all within the field area so there's some drift catch, and some of the dips that we saw probably has to do with some drift from spray programs. With the spray programs, as far as SWD, never seeing an SWD, everybody's spray program was working <laughs> very well. There may be other factors, such as the mowing, the type of uh, either grass or no grass between the rows, how much stuff is put down underneath the plants. There's lots of different, some had plastic covers, some get the hog fuel, some get sawdust, whatever. So that could be influencing this also. And basically, our results show that these hedgerows don't seem to be affecting adversely what's going on in the crop. So if we have any questions, I think I'm fumbled through it. Sorry about that. I dazzled you with my BS. What's going on? Okay. Any questions at all? None? Ah, right there. Yes, sir. So in the last two years when we've had a fairly wet spring, um, I we have honeybees. We 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 have we have hives on our property yes and so I, but i have noticed fewer and fewer honeybees going into the blueberries and most of the pollination seems to be being done by the um, bumblebees is that you'll have to ask him that question to matt <laughs> okay, okay. He's, he... yeah so 
just to repeat the question, so it was, there seems to be less honeybees entering the field and more of the pollination happening by bumblebees. And I think that uh, it's hard to, to really give a good answer to that. We don't really have a good estimation of what level um, of pollination is being done by those native pollinators, other than that we know they're very important and that they're highly effective pollinators in blueberry. Um, and then this next pro this, the next presentation, I'll talk a little bit about our, our pollination um, projects and maybe that'll help shed a little light on that. No, no, you're <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hi, my first question is for Matt. And when you showed us the yellow sticky cards, you talked about early and late measurements. Can you tell us the dates of those, please? Yeah, so the dates, um, those were more or less averages of a couple of dates, but essentially it's the beginning of May and then uh, mid-July uh, are more or less the, the dates that were used there. My second question is for Hollis. Um, and maybe for the rest of you, I didn't see much blackberries in those hedgerows that you showed. Do you have any sense of the impact of that? There were blackberries in one of the herbaceous, I mean, the uh, perennial areas, but they never really got started because they're back underneath the trees. So it's not like what I'm sure you, sh where you get these hedgerows, really, of blackberries. Uh, one of the other control locations had a few but it looked like they were doing a pretty good herbicide program <laughs> to knock them down. So again, now, well, there was another, one of the other areas down by, uh, in uh, our county, there was a blackberry right next to where I was doing the sucking. And again, I was going, okay, we're going to find an SWD, you know. No, never did. And it was right on a fence line, right next to where, where I was doing my sampling. And so I really, you know, I even picked blackberries out of the blackberries as they started to ripen. And again, nothing happened that year, this year. Thank you. Deb? Deb? Yeah. Okay. And uh, in this case, uh, we didn't find any SWD in the blueberry field. No SWD was reported in the blueberry field. This was an organic blueberry field. And uh, they were picking, well, I would say that they were picking up uh, a lot of males on these pheromone attractant type traps, sticky traps, but uh, no, no hits in the berries. And so we looked at the blackberries adjacent and we found SWD in those blackberries. Now, explain to me why they didn't go to those blueberries. That's a that's a real good question and still a real puzzle. Uh, so uh, that's something we might be following this next year. Uh, have you you guys utilized the uh, the new sticky traps with the pheromone? And what are you finding? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm glad to hear you tried those traps as well. We did a comparison with the. Uh, alpha scent sticky traps and just our regular apple cider vinegar and we found that they both perform comparatively but after a couple of weeks the vinegar started to win so um and as far as gender i have I haven't looked at that yet so um you did find spotted wing then just not in your vinegar traps okay And on site, at the at the university, we have uh, raspberries, which we don't take care of very well. They get sprayed never, or at least this year they never did. We put three different types of traps out there, uh, three of them with different types of pheromones, supposedly, and in regular vinegar. I would say the same thing. Vinegar does it just as easy. It's cheaper, you know. And they didn't come though, into those raspberries until late July and then it was like in August we couldn't find them for a while and then September boom so explain it I don't know it was like you know they knew we were trying to do some experiments I really believe that of course I used to blame Lionel too that he used to walk through a field and he could clean out an insect of any type just by walking through the field okay I'm leaving 